The Battle of Kufit would see the Ethiopians fight one of their first major battles against the Mahdist armies, a major threat to Ethiopian sovereignty. This will be the last of the covered episodes fought in northern Ethiopia and modern Eritrea for a while, as we'll be moving farther south to check out the events developing in Shawa after this episode. Following the Ethiopian victory over Egypt in the Egyptian-Ethiopian War, Emperor Johannes would see an apex to his power. The expansionist Egyptian threat was nullified, Johannes amazingly managed to extract four bishops from Egypt, and, furthering his plans to unify Ethiopia, he launched a campaign force to forcefully convert Muslims to Christianity, and to subdue heretics who believed contradictory forms of Christianity. Claims have been made that Johannes and other major rulers of Ethiopia forcefully converted up to 50,000 Muslims, 20,000 pagans, and half a million Oromo by 1880 alone, including many major political figures, though, naturally, many continued to practice their original religions in secret, and many others fled to Sudan as refugees. Most attempts at rebellion by the converted, especially those in Wallo, were brutally halted, though some leaders would continue to operate against Ethiopian interests from new bases closer to Sudan. While Johannes had already obtained submission from Ras Adal of Gojam in 1874, he also finally managed to get Menelik to submit to him by 1878. Furthermore, the Hewitt Treaty negotiated between the British, who had colonized Egypt, and the Ethiopians gave the latter control of Bogos again. Johannes got this land on the condition that he assist Egyptian armies with the evacuation of forts such as Algira and Batema. However, Johannes never managed to get control of Massawa through negotiations with the British, and instead had to settle for free trade through the port. Furthermore, the Mahdist Rising posed a major threat. They replaced the nullified Egyptian threat with an active one of their own. The Mahdist Rising in 1881 resulted in the crushing of Egyptian influence in Sudan, along with many of the ports and cities that they once had. These cities include the important Islamic center and trading city of Harar, helping to open the pathway for Menelik's later expansion there. It's debatable that the Mahdist Rising was also what prompted the British to sign the Hewat Treaty with the Ethiopians to begin with, as they needed allies in the region, and the Ethiopians would not let down on this front. Seeing how well the Ethiopians evacuated Egyptian troops during their assigned missions, the British requested that the Ethiopians assist them on more expeditions, which the Ethiopians, knowing the usefulness of British allies, often agreed to take part in. By 1884, Shalaka Alula, now promoted to Governor or Ras of territory north of the Mareb River, was requested to go to Kassala to relieve an Egyptian garrison there. But after further information was delayed for months on end, these plans eventually fell apart. Despite Kassala being one of the last standing Egyptian forts in the region, little effort was put into actually relieving it. In 1885, Rasalula warned that it would probably fall, and in late June, made a last request to relieve the fort before the rainy season set in which would make campaigning too difficult to be feasible. In July of 1885, Kassala fell, essentially exposing Ethiopia's northern front, and Uthman Dikna, a powerful Mahdist commander, began an advance with the intent of spreading the word of the Mahdi. The Mahdist leader, Khalifa Abdallah Taishi, wasn't eager to potentially engage in combat with the Ethiopians, and would have rather dealt with the more active British-Egyptian threat, both for religious and political reasons. He sent the following message in a letter to Uthman Dikna, to attempt to get him to withdraw. We heard the news of your advance to Ethiopia, but, my beloved, things should be arranged according to their importance. Do not attach great importance to the Ethiopian affair. Leave the Ethiopians and do not enter their country now.
Despite the letter clearly advising against provoking the Ethiopians, it didn't deter Othman Dikna, probably because it arrived too late. And by the middle of September, after the rainy season ended, Othman Dikna had likely arrived at Kufit. Rasalula, of course, was not intent on waiting for the Mahdist to come to him, and he mobilized from his base at Azmeda after the Ethiopian celebration of Holy Cross Day, or Mashkal, celebrated on September 13th. The Mahdist and Ethiopian armies competing in this battle were both composed of about 10,000 men, but finding details on the specifics is challenging. It is likely that, along with more traditional swords, spears, and shields, the Ethiopians under Ras Alula had access to and used Remington rifles captured from the Egyptians during previous wars. On discussion of Ethiopian guns, it looks like Ras Alula and his army had access to some guns recently supplied by the British during this engagement, though the specifics on what kind of gun these were is not known to me. Aside from the main infantry force, cavalry units that were present at the battle were mostly allied by Nuemir pastoralists, led by Musay al Fayel. The presence of the Banu Amir, who fought on the side of the Ethiopians, is noteworthy, as, despite the common framing of Mahdist Ethiopian conflict as purely that of Christianity versus Islam, the Banu Amir are a Muslim population. The Mahdist army that engaged Ras Alula was one in its infancy at this point, and, as with the Ethiopian army, specifics on equipment are hard to come by. Of course, much of the Mahdist army would have been equipped with traditional swords, spears, and shields. And, given known information on the Mahdist army at this point, gunmen would have likely been equipped with rolling block Remington rifles captured from the Egyptians, the same kind that the Ethiopians had also captured, and possibly Martini Henry guns, though this is significantly less likely. However, the Mahdist armies had a significant disadvantage with gun use, as they were significantly less accustomed to it, and are said to have fired too high. Their practice of shortening gun barrels also likely hurt their range, which definitely did not help them during this battle. There are two slightly different descriptions of this battle, keep that in mind. Combat was initiated on September 23rd, when Ras Alula sent some cavalry, possibly the Banu Amir, to scout ahead. The cavalry found the Mahdist army in entrenchments, but were repelled after heavy gunfire. After this, Ras Alula sent forward an infantry force under Balata Gabru, and both they, the Banu Amir, and the Mahdists charged towards one another. Balata Gabru was quickly killed, along with several other Ethiopian generals, but the Ethiopian army did manage to successfully break through the Mahdist center. While this happened, Rasalula and his force charged, and despite his force being killed from under him, the Ras continued to fight on foot. The Mahdist army was gradually pushed back, and the Ethiopian army surrounded the Mahdist army. The Mahdist situation was made worse, as the Ethiopian cavalry force had managed to reform, in spite of the loss of one of its commanders, and found itself facing the Mahdist camp. They ran through it, killing many women and non-fighting men, and then proceeded to kill those who were fleeing the main engagement. In the end, Othman Dikna, who was reportedly nearly captured twice, would suffer about 3,000 dead, possibly up to 5 or 10,000 if additional camp followers are factored in. The Ethiopians, in comparison, would suffer about 1,500 to 2,000 dead. But victorious, 
Rasalula's army would triumphantly return to Asmeda, singing victory songs and showing off captured weapons and Mahdist banners. The Battle of Kufit would see one of Ethiopia's first major victories in combat against the Mahdist armies. Combat that would continue to escalate. Furthermore, the conflict significantly stabilized the Northern Front, and caused the Mahdists to even lose some regional allies. This was actually further compounded by a successful Ethiopian assault on Matama, led by Ras Adal, at this point known as Nagus Tekle Haimanot, which resulted in the freeing of refugees from Mahdist Sudan, including the Egyptian governor of Matama. It's possible that if the British had properly followed up these events with further assault, Mahdist Sudan would have been devastated, but as it is, this is about all that happened. Of course now, as hinted at earlier, this wasn't the only front from which the Mahdists and Ethiopians would fight, and there was still a southern front to cover, and unlike the relatively stabilized northern front, it was really heating up.